So today we're going to be talking about research integrity. Uh, just to outline, I'm probably going to chat for an hour or just under an hour. And then that leaves us plenty of time afterwards to, to have discussion or raise questions. But if you feel there's something burning, please raise your hand during the presentation. We can chat about things in situ too. Um, so today I'm briefly going to cover what is research integrity and then look at uh, why it is important. Then look at what's research misconduct, um, what drives it, and how we can then respond to that to foster integrity and in research um, in our environment. And then the last few slides will look specifically at Stellenbosch University's policies and procedures that are relevant to, to research integrity and chat a bit about the support structures that are in place and those that are still being developed. So, so what is research integrity? Um, if we look at the definition of, definition of integrity, it usually at the center of that involves honesty. So it's the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Um, and we've seen this quote quite a lot that integrity is often the choice between doing what's convenient and, and what's right. So when we look at research integrity, it's really about as researchers and active adherence to the ethical principles and the professional standards that are essential for responsible conduct of research. And when we're talking um, in the realm of research integrity about ethical principles and professional standards, they involve things like honesty, responsibility, trustworthiness and fairness, accountability, and also a very high regard for, for the scientific record. So I often try to think about how research integrity is different from or separate from, from research ethics because it helps us think about it. I think they both fall under responsible conduct of research and we're all familiar with research ethics. It's, it's the ethical design of the protocol. Um, it's the thoughtful application of, of research ethics principles and compliance with, with guidelines, um, laws and regulations. And this is usually enacted institutionally through research ethics committee review. Research integrity, on the other hand, really speaks to the conduct of the investigator, or the moral conduct of the investigator. So having moral sensitivity, virtuous behavior, but also um, adhering to these high professional standards. And at the moment in our academic communities, this is usually monitored through peer review, various forms, forms of, of peer review. So why is it important? I mean, at the, at the center of it all, I think, is trust. Um, it's important because at the core of it, researchers can trust in each other if they know the research is integrous. They can trust in the research record. And it's also at the core of society's trust in, in research evidence and research expertise. And we know trust in research is earned, at least society's trust in research is earned by being transparent and also performing research that's relevant to, to that society, that's ethically sound and that is of high quality. If we, if we look at sloppy research or questionable research practices, they can undermine trust. And I'll show now in the coming slides also how they can tend to distort, distort the evidence base. So <clears throat> I'm battling to see my slides on this PDF version. I'm just trying to get a version here. Um, very recently, uh, we've seen an article in Science that explains a number of scientists quitting the journal vaccines, the, the journal board of the journal vaccines protesting some grossly irresponsible study that claimed that COVID-19 vaccines kill. I mean, I'm just using this as a, a recent example. Um, essentially, they resigned as editors of the journal um, to protest the publication. They claimed that it misused data to conclude that for three deaths prevented by the vaccine, we have to accept two inflicted by the vaccine. And um, in the evaluation of the study, it was confirmed that the data was misused because it made the incorrect, incorrect assumption that all deaths occurring post-vaccination were actually caused by the vaccine. And now this paper is being cited and used by anti-vaxxers and COVID deniers as evidence that the COVID vaccines are not safe. And we often talk about this in research ethics and, and integrity. 
um, that if the data that goes in or the analysis goes in is garbage, we've got garbage in and, and garbage out. And it's something that we have to be really mindful of. Historically, we've seen how similar practices, similar question, questionable research practices can distort the evidence base and then also affect public opinion and buy in for important public health interventions. So we may all know about Wakefield's 1998 article in The Lancet, which claimed that um, it linked the MMR vaccine to autism. Ten years later, he was discredited and scrapped from the medical register in the UK, but he still has a, a quite a huge following. And this is just clips of some of the recent articles um, that have come out sort of addressing the fact that the research was fraudulent and um, that he was discredited. But it seems like it's still affecting public buy-in for important public health interventions. So how does this happen? And this is what's really interesting because what happens is this dubious research um, haunts the academic liter literature, you could say, long after the retractions happen. So there was a recent article in The Economist that talks a, that labels this research zombie research and says zombie research haunts academic literature long after its supposed demise. But the idea is that even in the cases that publications are attracted, if the research was fraudulent or found to be questionable science, they continue to be cited in the academic, academic literature even long after the retraction. So this Economist um, article posted a very inter interesting graph, which I think sort of illustrates this in a very visual way. Um, and you'll see the top bar is incidences of papers that were retracted because of errors. The middle bar is citations of those retraction retracted papers. And the bottom bar is citations of the papers that cited the original retracted papers. And you can see that even for some of those papers that were retracted in the 1970s, um, you know, the one obviously striking example that they've labeled, there were 600, about 650,000 citations of an article that was retracted. And you can see sort of visually how this may start to distort the integrity of the evidence base. And we all know that we disseminate research findings because we want to accumulate evidence. We want this evidence to inform decision making and clinical practice, to influence policy, and government spending and to determine future lines of research. So if dubious research starts to distort the integrity of the evidence base, it can also end up misinforming policy, government spending and the direction of future lines of research. So what is this dubious research? What is research misconduct? Um, traditionally speaking, academics refer to research misconduct as the FFP, the fa Fabrication, Falsification and Plagiarism. And this can be either in proposing um, research, performing research, reviewing research, or in the reporting of research results. Fabrication is simply making up data or results and, re and recording them or reporting them as if they are real. Falsification is, is what people refer to as cooking data. So it's not making it up, but it's manipulating some of those research materials or the processes or the equipment or changing or omitting data or results without scientific justification. And plagiarism, we know, is the use of either your own work or someone else's work without adequately referencing the source. But if we look at the spectrum of research conduct, research misconduct is this sort of small component on the one end of a continuum. Um, on the other end of that continuum is what we want to label responsible conduct of research. So that's the active adherence to ethical principles and professional standards. And in reality, we have this big blurry middle section which involve questionable research practices, a range of, of questionable research practices. And recent research shows that these shady or questionable research practices are not that uncommon. So there was a systematic review in 2009 that did a meta-analysis of survey data. There, and another more recent Dutch study that Lex Bota has presented on um, quite a bit that analyzed um, or that was published this year. And the stats from both of those 
put ranges on, on questionable research practices and research misconduct. And you can see research misconduct is, is quite low, somewhere between 2 and 14 percent um, across different institutions. But questionable research practices is a pretty hefty chunk. And if you, even if we take the conservative end of that estimate, what it's saying is one in three scientists is admitting to using questionable research practices. So what are these? It's things like poor data management. We'll hear a lot more about how to do that in October. Um, poor mentorship and supervision. And surprisingly, this one in the studies has shown up, well, maybe not surprisingly, um, to be one of the biggest indicators of, of um, questionable research practices is poor mentorship and supervision. Salami slicing publications, um, not declaring conflicts of interest or not managing them, sloppy science, <clears throat> improper allocation of authorship and failure in general to follow accepted research procedures. Um, so what drives research misconduct? I mean, I think the important thing is we, it's never justified, but it is it is helpful to understand what drives it so that we can better prevent it. And um, this was a, just quotes that from people who admitted to research misconduct in closed Office of Research Integrity Cases at the NIH. Um, they've got a, a lovely poster which sort of separates it out into categories. So they've also captured these causes of, of poor supervision or inadequate training. So people are saying, well, I was scared um, or I, I didn't really know how to do that. Um, one of the key factors for them was sort of career pressures or competitive pressures, um, you know, trying to advance faculty positions uh, and then personal personal circumstances or individual psychology. What I did for this slide was <clears throat> I've taken the data from four different studies that are cited at the bottom um, to look at the key factors that came out of those studies for driving research misconduct. And there's, there's quite a few, and they're a mix of what I would call sort of institutional factors and individual factors. I mean, in reality, it's, it's, it's quite a messy mix of both that tends to drive individuals. Um, but things like career and funding pressures, perverse incentives, um, in institutional failures of oversight, commercial conflicts of interest, inadequate training or poor mentoring and supervision, and then things like personal circumstance or individual psychology. Sometimes it's part of a larger pattern of social deviance. Sometimes it's just about managing personal conflicts of interest. And in some cases, it's about uh, studies have revealed that it's about a perceived low probability of, of being caught, basically. You can kind of loosely group these into into two classes. As I said, I don't think it's it's so neat in reality, but some of these causes rest on the virtuousness of the individual and others um, rest on the research climate of the institution. And I think when we start to try and think about uh, how to address research misconduct or questionable research practices, we have to come at it from from both of both of these sides. Um, I just wanted to look a bit at some of these in more detail, and the first is perverse incentives. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, the recent, um, well, 2019 uh, Nature commentary by William Heading, who, who said payouts push professors towards predatory journals. Um, and he, he claimed that if South Africa truly wants to encourage good research, must stop paying academics by the paper. Um, obviously, this is quite a controversial topic, but what he argues is if you have publication subsidies in place, it corrodes the quality of scholarship in general. It discourages collaboration because people don't want to essentially split the funds. Um, and it promotes several other counterproductive practices like salami slicing or targeting journals that are easier to, to publish in. If I think through um, perverse incentives and read the ethics literature in terms of, you know, how they may influence behavior, um, I think about it like this, uh, you know, you, you, a paper publication is a strong behavioral incentive and, and we know that, that incentives can and will be gamed if the stakes are high. Um, we also know that incentives work well for obviously the intended effect. 
So they are going to garner more publications. Um, but they also work very well for unintended effects. And some of those un unintended effects are a focus on quantity instead of quality, more plagiarism and duplicate publication, more salami slicing gift authorship and the use of predatory journals, and less time consuming responsible research practices. Um, Oh, this is not coming out nice on the PDF, and I apologize. I was unable to load my PowerPoint this morning. But this says the bottom line is that incentives matter. We need to avoid, and we need to avoid the unintended effects. Nicola? Yes. I just, I think the slides, I'm not sure, the slides are now at number 34 of 63. And a few people commented that they couldn't, they didn't see them moving forward. I'm not sure if... Uh, on which on which number are you at the moment? Can I, you see that on your side? We're I currently on the on the slide talking about what drives research misconduct. Oh, it hasn't moved forward. Oh dear. Hmm. It's, sorry, it's on thirty six. We're still seeing number 34 on our side. Oh, I don't have control. I'm sorry, Tarina. I don't have control at the moment. Um. Uh, Whitney, on your side, did you move forward to 36? No, we see only you, Nicola. No screen, no slides. I see, my slides have disappeared. Sorry, can I just, I'll just re upload it just one second. Okay, thanks, Whitney. Yeah, technical glitches is part and parcel of In online way. meetings. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question there, Nicola, which you could maybe um, try to address. Uh, somebody's asking, is there a place or a site we can check to find out if papers have been retracted? Yes, there is actually an organization that has devoted um, their time entirely to this called Retraction Watch. And they have a website um, where you can go. They, they try to, obviously, I don't know if they do it 100%, but they try to track retractions um, as, as far as possible. And they list them there, um, along with any other information that they have about the paper. Nicola? What? Salami Could you slice? Maybe, yeah. You <laughs> may, maybe you can just explain the salami slicing analogy. Um, so salami slicing is a colloquial term that has been assigned to the act of instead of, you know, someone may um, conduct a research study and instead of publishing one paper that describes the study and all the results, they divide that up into a large number of papers. They sort of um, slice it, if you will, into as smaller portions as possible in order to um, up the number of publications that comes out of any one piece of research. Uh, and in some cases, it makes sense, of course, to, to have separate publications about separate angles or separate components. And in other cases, it's an unnecessary um, uh, sort of dwindling down or slicing up of, of those research results. Does that answer your question? Mr. Jordan. Um, thanks, Malene, for posting the Retraction Watch link. OK, great. I hope I can, um, maybe, Whitney, we could go back to slide number 34, where everyone was, was last seen. Is that possible? Whitney? Nicola, perhaps yeah. let's carry on from okay. the slide. Um, Apologies, I'm happy to share the slides as a PDF with you. Okay, I'm on 34 now. Oh, are we going back? On your side. Is it we still see number 37, Whitney. We are currently in 34. 
Mm. Yeah, we we don't see that. I'm not sure what everybody else is seeing, but I'm seeing 37 of 63 on my side. 37, oh, yeah. No. Okay, let me just continue from here then. Okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> right. It, it, there's a bit of a delay, so we will Thanks, have to Lydia. deal with that. Okay, so this is where, where we left you off with the slides. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was talking ahead was looking right on my side. Um, okay, so we, we said you can loosely divide these into two sorts of categories and that helps you um, determine the way forward in terms of how you want to address those. But in real life, it's really messy. Uh, it's probably a mix of, of a number of these factors that contributes towards questionable research practices. Um, and then I wanted to move forward and focus on uh, perverse incentives. Can we all see slide 35? Just checking. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the, the article that was published in Nature, the commentary that was published in Nature in 2019 by William by David Heading, who is a, a South African academic. And he um, suggested that payouts push professors towards predatory journals. Um, and that if South Africa truly wants to encourage good research, it must stop paying academics by the paper. Um, I did talk you through the slide, but essentially he said it, this kind of um, incentive is, is going to corrode the quality of scholarship, um, discourage collaboration and promote several other counter counterproductive practices. And, and when I think about perverse incentives, um, I've tried to sort of think it through in this slide. So, well, we know paper publication, which has been considered a perverse incentive, is a strong behavioral incentive. And we know incentives can and will be gamed if the stakes are high. And um, we also know that incentives work well for both the intended effects, which in this case is more publications, which is great, but they also work well for the unintended effects um, like a focus on quantity um, and some of the other questionable research practices that uh, can come about when people are focusing on getting more papers out rather than on more quality papers out. I'm progressing to 37. So the bottom line um, at the end of the day when it comes to this is that incentives matter and we need to avoid the unintended effects. And this has also been argued to apply to the rules for the appointment of professors and tenure tracks and for how we should res assess researchers um, for their career advancement. So, so how can we foster integrity in research? Um, and I think before I start with, with, with some of the ideas on that, um, just to just to reiterate that we're going to have to do that as individual researchers, but there's also a responsibility for research institutions, um, for funders and for journal editors um, to do the same. I think the first component of fostering integrity res in research is um, familiarity with codes and guidelines. And there, there's quite a lot out there. And what I'm going to try to do in the next five or six slides is just give you um, a bit of information on each code and what it applies to, so that if it applies to you um, or the kind of work that you're involved in, you know where to look. The Singapore Statement um, was a publication that came out of one of the World Conferences of uh, Research Integrity. Uh, it was hosted in Singapore in 2010, and this statement applies um, largely to individual researchers. It has four principles. And then it has 14 professional responsibilities that that point um, us as researchers in the right direction in terms of the kinds of behaviors that we should be aspiring to, the times the the, the way in which we should collaborate, um, and the way in which we should have a high regard for the, the scientific record. The Montreal statement also came out of a World Conference of Research Integrity in 2013. And this one was drafted specifically to apply to research in cross-country um, research collaborations. And it outlines the responsibilities of individuals and institutional partners. In 2019, um, another set of principles to come out of the World Congress of Research Integrity were the Hong Kong principles. Um, 
These are, are now trying to shift the focus towards ensuring that researchers are explicitly recognized and rewarded for behaviors that strengthen research integrity and that promote trustworthy research. And they've um, talked about five principles and then given implementation examples for each. And I guess this one obviously, quite obviously targets institutions in terms of the kinds of, of systems or incentives or rewards that could be set up for um, promoting these kinds of behaviours. In 2020, there was um, also the Global Code of Conduct released. Uh, the primary purpose of this code was to fight ethics dumping in research. So, and ethics dumping is, is the export of unethical practices from high income countries to low income countries. We see this happening uh, more frequently than we would like. Um, and it's often done because there's the thought that it could be done quicker or cheaper, or um, that there's less sort of regulatory oversight in the lower income setting. This, um, this code is great. It has four values and 23 associated articles or statements. It's worth a read and it's worth sharing with researchers in your environment. Um, Stellenbosch University also formally adopted the Global Code of Conduct for research and resource poor settings. This is for those that are interested in reading a um, more descriptive text. It's a lot longer, but it applies to researchers, research funders and research administrators. And it is a good text on research integrity. It's just, it's a lot. There were also this year um, some guidelines released on, on what's been labeled self-plagiarism. It's also called text recycling. Um, and it's the first of its kind to attempt to outline what constitutes ethical and legal self-plagiarism, and it gives examples. Uh, so this is quite helpful, I guess, in your own writing, um, especially where you are doing uh, the kind of research where you're repeating very similar methodologies, um, where and when it's okay to repeat some of that text and, and how to transparently communicate that with uh, editors of journals um, and your institution so that so that it's all transparent. This the that code came out of what is called the the text recycling research project and I'm sharing this uh, website with you because it has a host of really valuable resources um, and each of these is sort of a clickable set of, of guidelines that are really easily accessible. If you're an, an editor of a journal, um, the students ones are coming, but if you're a researcher, all of these guidelines are already here. And they give uh, very detailed guidance with examples of what kind of um, uh, text you can now recycle and, and what would be considered ethically or legally unacceptable. As we know, there's also the, the ICMJE guideline on authorship um, that was updated most recently in 2019. And that's really about um, the conduct or reporting, editing and, and publication of scholarly work in medical journals. But it gives us a, a set of, of really good criteria um, for, for meeting authorship requirements. And, and they talk about the four criteria of, of contributions, um, drafting and revising, final approval and accountability. And, and so this is also a very helpful guideline if you're, if you're trying to figure out how to assign authorship or to reflect on whether um, certain practices are fair or not. So aside from becoming familiar with the guidelines, um, I think fostering integrity in research also entails good mentorship and supervision. And as I mentioned previously, this was one of the biggest factors that came out of the Dutch study um, as well as the, the uh, systematic review study, that mentorship and supervision had quite a big influence on, on research integrity um, in research. So improving the supervision of postgraduates towards responsible conduct of research would be something that we should focus quite a bit of weighted attention to. And this is just an example um, of five qualities of good research mentors. But when I did a bit of research um, previously just for the presentation, there, there's quite a lot of resources out there and educational material on improving mentorship. 
In addition to supervision and mentorship, uh, obviously there's got to be education and training. And um, I think at Stellenbosch University, we have a fair amount of, of research ethics training in place and growing, um, and it's it's offered regularly. Um, and one, uh, one example that we heard about in the World Conference of Research Integrity, which moves away from the sort of research ethics training towards integrity training, and these are um, sort of training workshops focusing on virtue ethics and uh, and sharing with with researchers uh, the kind of virtue ethics that we should be aspiring to in our work. Um, there's a really good example of this called um, the Embassy Science Project, and uh, they have developed materials that we are currently looking into to adapt uh, to develop a similar course for the university. Fostering integrity in research also means we we create a healthy publication climate. And I love this cartoon because it does depict the evolution of academia quite well. In the beginning, it was publish, then it was publish or perish, then it was publish in a high impact journal or perish, and then it was um, publish frequently in a high impact journal and maybe you won't perish. <laughs> and I think it does really reflect the kind of pressure that we feel as academics um, to publish in order to in advance our career. Um, and so creating a healthy publication climate is about creating a research climate in institutions or journals that incentivize researchers to optimize quality and integrity rather than, than quantity. There's some examples of, of how this has been done or examples of models um, that have been developed that suggest how this can be done. And I've just picked two that that don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, um, you know, here is an example of uh, this was published in 2020. It took the Hong Kong principles for assessing researchers and and tried to um, develop quite an interesting model. Um, and it's an example of how to change that game of incentivizing um, and rewarding without ignoring the numbers. So it doesn't mean we have to throw away publication numbers altogether, it just means maybe we add these other indices that, that can assess some of these um, responsible research conduct practices. Another example was a, a recent publication um, in Nature called Research Integrity, Nine Ways to Move from Talk to Walk. And they also um, share a lot of resources on how institutions can promote best practices in science. Essentially, they've sort of broken it down into a number of categories um, on the research environment, supervision and mentoring, and the kinds of actions that an institution could undertake to try and move toward assessment of responsible research conduct. So I, I'm... I'm Heading to the last few slides and moving to a focus on Stellenbosch University's policies and procedures that are relevant to, to research integrity. Um, to start with our, our policies, um, we have a research policy, Stellenbosch University research policy. Um, we also have a policy for the response for responsible research conduct. And then linked to that, the procedure for the investigation of allegations of breaches of, of research norms and standards. Stellenbosch University also has a standalone policy on plagiarism and then linked to that the procedure for the investigation and management of allegations of plagiarism. And how do how do we currently support recent research integrity? I would say through two um, set two main or key mechanisms. The first is to promote and foster research integrity and responsible conduct of research. And so we offer advice and support at all stages for all aspects of the research process. Training, um, so research integrity, research ethics, um, publishing, plagiarism, etc. And this is often offered on a formal level and an informal level if we're invited to particular environments. Um, policy and guideline development and then integration um, through myself as the research integrity officer and the office of research integrity. Um, of various aspects of research integrity at the institution. And then obviously, um, in my role as real I'll also respond to any allegations of research misconduct or breaches of research norms and standards. This slide depicts what, what Stellenbosch University and its policy has defined as breaches of research norms and standards. So you'll see at the top there are the classic three of fabrication, falsification and plagiarism. But we have also um, 
a, a number of other breaches of research norms and 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 standards that align more with sort of questionable research practices, and um, each would obviously be evaluated on its own merit and in the context of the case. Um, so some of those are, for example, just failing to follow accepted research procedures um, or failing to prevent risk to other people in your environment or in the environment around you, or failing to adequately pr protect privacy or confidentiality of, of participant information, or inappropriately managing research funds and other resources, or authorship problems, etc. There's a wide array of, of behaviours. Essentially, if a complaint um, does come to the, if uh, the, the official procedure begins with the reception of a complaint that goes to the research integrity officer, um, I do want to say that though, you know, following the central process should really be the last resort because once you escalate it through the, the central complaint process, it can transform what, what is a dispute into something far more sinister. And in most cases, much more can be achieved prior to that, either at the departmental or the faculty level. And in most cases, the key is really communication. Um, I'm here to advise, discuss, and find a way through to resolution, regardless of whether it stays at the departmental or faculty level, whether it comes um, to a case. And if it does require escalation, the process has a very set uh, format which includes protecting identity um, and in some cases the appointment of a formal investigational committee or FIC um, who then conducts the investigation and produces a report with recommendations and that report is final. I also just wanted to encourage you to get in touch with us. So, you know, for general information and guidelines on research integrity and ethics, you are welcome to visit our website, which has a lot of resources available there. And we're also here to help. So if you have any questions about the ethical design of your protocol or any questions about responsible conduct of research, you can contact us and I've embedded links in there that will take you to either the ethics committees um, or to my own email address as the research integrity officer. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you and the remaining time that we have left, perhaps let's chat about research integrity and responsible conduct of research. I'm happy to try and address your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Nicola. Um, I think I would like to give um, everybody the opportunity to raise their hands. Um, I'll try to, to keep track of who's raising hands. I did note down a few questions. So if you could maybe, if we could maybe, um, while people are, are gathering their thoughts, um, uh, just look at that. So one of the questions was, how can one prove that data is falsified? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's so hard to answer these questions as a once off because I think, you know, at the bottom, at the end of the, at the end of the day, what I've realized is every case is, is so unique. And um, one has to really, in those cases, conduct a very thorough investigation to, to look at some of the, the processes, um, uh, the data itself. Um, it, would, it would take a very close look at, you know, it would require uh, a very close look at the processes that were implemented as well as the data itself. But um, there's no one short answer to prove that it was falsified. It would obviously have to be investigated and it would involve, you know, experts who could, who would be able to identify um, patterns or, or anomalies, I think. Yeah. Okay. And that could, that can be picked up at any point um, during peer review, during examination of thesis. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and sometimes also, years after the fact. Um, I think in the past we've seen that some of these studies are discredited years after the after mm. they were published um, and that the falsification is then identified. So yeah, that that's um, that's not an easy question to answer. Mm -hmm. Another question from Nugent's side was just how does incompetence sometimes play into research misconduct? And and I guess um, 
yeah, you said also that we are trying to educate and prevent and and uh, provide good mentorship and supervision. But it's obvious that for early career researcher, uh, there could be a real um, problem in not not understanding how to avoid some of these things. So maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you when when you first enter your research career, you are understandably research naive, and that would include. Um, not knowing necessarily what all the requirements are for research ethics and research integrity. I think as as early career researchers, this is where the supervision and mentoring really comes in. Um, and I think this is why the studies are also showing that. Um, you know, this is such a big factor uh, because it is impossible to absorb everything you need to know about research um, when you start off your career and you rely on your mentors and supervisors to be able to share that that information with you and that knowledge um, to reach out to them to ask them what the right thing is to do or for them to guide you when they see you going in the wrong direction um, so i think yes incompetence or, or if we want to use a, a slightly less severe word um, you know just non-familiarity with the general uh, with general good research practices um, or with the guidelines and codes and this is where mentoring and supervision comes into play in a very important way. Katrin, I see your hand. Please go ahead. Thanks, thanks Jirena. I have uh, two questions. The one follows on what you've said just now, um, and it has to do with the dynamic nature of research. So I think by its very nature, research will continuously question itself and interrogate itself and come up with um, results that uh, that prove that um, other results that were previously thought of as valid are no longer valid. Mm. Um, so how does one deal um, with this sort of fine line between um, disproving previously valid research findings mm. because of new technology or new information and dealing with um, re research that simply didn't adhere to research integrity. Yeah. No, I think this is where the, the codes and standards come into play because I think it's natural and we know that science advances so quickly that, you know, three years from now we may have a technique that is able to research a particular topic in a much better way or um, there's a better um, process or a better test um, and so we will always be advancing knowledge of course um, and that makes sense and reflecting on the stuff we've done previously and, and asking whether we need to refine that or not. So I, I think what when we look at that kind of general progression, progression of the academic project, the, the grand ap academic project, it's different, the difference would be if we reflected back and we saw that the research methods that were employed by that researcher were were substandard and that there were there were problems that looked like those questionable research practices that I described to you, then we then we might be able to say, okay, well that research was um, was questionable. It wasn't of high scientific quality, and that's the reason we did it. versus that was the technology that we had at the time. That's as far as we could go. It's a very it's a very different story. Does that make sense? You still there, Catherine? Make <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, my second question had to do with something you said right at the beginning about um, what um, makes uh, what makes what is the making of of in, of, of research integrity, mm -hmm. and you mentioned relevance. So I wanted to ask you about that. How is relevance mm -hmm. and determined? Um, I come from um, I come from uh, from the languages um, I, I teach French. So these are European languages. We do research that might be seen as having um, specific relevance um, mm. in the local context, but a lot of our research simply has to do with um, with humanity. So it is relevant in. Um, in the sense that we are all humans, but um, it may not be seen as particularly relevant for a local and very specific context. Yeah. How? What are the measures of, of of relevance? So, so in ethics, we generally refer to this as uh, social value, um, and 
there aren't, uh, it's not quantifiable measures that one can assign to the kind of research that you're doing. It's rather um, being able to demonstrate that the findings of this research will be relevant either to that field or to society in general, um, and sometimes very locally relevant. Um, I, I think, you know, it matters more from an ethical perspective once you start introducing risk to your participants. So, you know, that then gets used as a very, um, as a weighing up exercise where an ethics committee would would look at the social value that your research is offering um, and maybe the value to individuals, and they would weigh that that up against the potential risk to those individuals. Um, and then if the social value is really high, that can justify, um, you know, a certain amount of risk, obviously not an inordinate amount. Um, and if the social value is very low, then there might be not enough reason to justify the risk. So I think in answer to your question, I, I hope it clarifies, it, it matters obviously because we want to be doing research that answer questions that are relevant to our society. Um, and it's going to matter more if, if, if you've got risk in your research because you need to offset that with that value. I mean, you can off, also offset it against, you know, the use of resources and other such things. But from, a, from an ethics perspective, when we're talking about participants and integrity, that's what we're thinking about. Thanks, thanks. The, the value makes, makes absolutely, absolute sense in that context. Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. I see Tanya Holmes Watts hand is, hand is up. Tanya, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Therina. Um, my, my question really, uh, the first one relates to um, the newly introduced um, act that came about on the 1st of July, the Papaya Act, the mm -hmm. Personal Protection of Information, that one. I just wanted to know um, what effect does that have on 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 this whole notion of ethics? Um, just just um, very you know briefly, um, does it have any? What how does that affect ethics and integrity as we know it and going forward? And the other question I just had was um, around the role and influence of the the officers responsible for this function of ethics and integrity within the university context. Um, it seems to me that this is a very key and crucial role because, I mean, the whole university's research mandate is affected by the uh, role and influence, and it's quite key. So mm. the people who function in that role, um, I think the caliber of the person, I mean, should be um, of such that, you know, uh, there's confidence that that, that that area is well handled. Um, are the responsible conduct in that role, is that safeguarded by the policies um, of the institutions? Um, and, and can more be done uh, uh, in that regard? Thanks. Okay. Okay, that's a lot. But let me start with the, the first one. And I'll hopefully remember, I've jotted down some notes. Um, the, the act that... The, the beginning of July was the, the, the final deadline for the implementation of PAPIA, which is the Protection of Personal Information Act. And yes, it, it does have an influence on ethics. Um, a lot of what came out in that legislation is fortunately already being done um, at our institution and had been implemented uh, prior to the beginning of, of this month by our ethics committees through various SOPs. Um, and there will be a very detailed, uh, a much more detailed address on this in the October presentation on data management. I just want to mention because this is not my specialist area. But yes, uh, the PAPIA Act focuses on the protection of personal information. So it works alongside uh, the existing ethics principles and the existing national ethics guidance to try and um, help us to protect the confidentiality and the privacy of those people that we involve in research activities. That um, hopefully addresses the first question. And the second one was the role and influence of the, the ethics role players at the institution. Um, I have to say, I think uh, Stellenbosch University is in a very fortunate position. We have a very strong um, network, ethics network. Uh, strong ethics committees. We have five ethics committees, uh, one for animal research, um, 
one for biosafety and environmental ethics, one for social science research, uh, social and behavioral research, and one for health, and two for health research, um, two health research ethics committees which evaluate health research. And I think we have um, a wealth of experience, um, technical skills, and expertise in both the, the offices that support um, those, those ethics committees and in the ethics committees themselves. Um, and then in terms of the your question about uh, relating these processes to policy um, when it comes to the investigations, absolutely. So um, there's a link on that uh, on that slide with the policies where you can go in and take a look at the policies if you if you're keen. Um, but essentially the policy itself and the procedure is is very specific about how, um, an investigation like this plays out. It's a very formal set of steps um, that has to be followed uh, very strictly, that is designed especially um, to create a fair process where both sides of the parties are, are heard and have an opportunity um, to share their perspectives. So yes, that is very, um, very strictly dictated by policy and procedure. Thanks, Nicola. Um, there was another question that was posted in the chat box. Um, sometimes we find citations that prove our, our already held beliefs and purposefully ignore those that do not support our beliefs. Can this be classified as unethical and thus compromising integrity of our research work? This is a great question. So thank you. Thank you for asking this. Um, yeah, I think this is the this is our tendency at human our tendency as human beings right we it's easier to accept and uh, to accept pieces of literature that confirm our existing narrative or concern, confirm our existing belief system um, and it would be much easier <clears throat> excuse me to purposefully ignore those that don't support support that um, and I think the answer to to this is yes. It it when you're in the research setting, you are expected to be objective. Um, you are the objective tool that is processing a wealth of information in a very scientific way to be able to present an honest picture of it to the world. So um, it would be your responsibility as a researcher to um, describe and take account of the citations that you like and the citations that maybe don't support your beliefs. Um, and if you feel there's a strong argument in favor of what, the one over the other, that has to be made scientifically in the context of your research. Um, this kind of picking and choosing um, of the literature that will support versus not support your arguments could, is, is, is definitely considered a, a questionable research practice. Thanks, Nicola. I'm reminded of, of one of the presentations I attended at iNorms once where it was said, with this, you have to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the yes. truth. So <laughs> it's also not leaving out bits of the truth. So, mm. yeah, it's it's uh, it's certainly good to remind us ourselves of that, um, that aspect. Are there any more questions from the audience? I'm happy to take your to take your hands or to take your questions in the chat box. Um, what I wanted to ask from my side, uh, Nicola, is you've shared with us uh, quite a few, in, at least in my view, some new resources yes. um, that we would we would like to share, I think, to, to this audience and much broader to our research community. Yes. So if we can put those things on our website, uh, make them available in a, in a very specific place where people could easily consult. I mean, I'm thinking of the newest on um, self-plagiarism, yes. um, on the the issues around, you, you know, walking, mm. walking the walk, <laughs> taking us from talk, talk yes. to walking the walk, that those nine steps, I think those could be immensely um, valuable mm. to our research community. And also the authorship, um, often we get you know, serious questions about authorship. Mm -hmm. And I think just having those um, those issues again and having resources for people. Karen, I see your hand. Please go ahead. Karen Isler. Yes, morning, everybody. 
Okay, um, so my question links to um, what happens when we collaborate with people outside the university. So there's quite a lot of jurisdiction within the university and their checks and balances. But when we start actually um, linking up with people external to the university, um, it, sometimes it, it becomes a lot more difficult um, to to kind of manage <laughs> that process. I, I, I was just wondering if you had any guidance on that, or does it mean that everything we do has to be governed by a, a memorandum of understanding? Or, you know, I mean, are we getting to that stage where it's uh, we just fight those kind of issues with more paperwork? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's the question I have. I guess maybe I just just a quick follow up so that I understand what your what your query is. Is it that you are being asked to do things that fall outside of the rules of Stellenbosch, or is it about the competing jurisdiction of of ethics guidance or ethics rules? Um, so I guess I'm just thinking of a particular instance um, that occurred with me where um, there was a dispute that was raised. Um, and it, it, was, it linked to somebody external to the university and it made things very complicated mm -hmm. um, to try and deal with because, you know, we have processes within yeah. the university, but external to the university, we don't. don't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so, I mean, you're right in that the policy and the procedure on um, breaches of research norms and conduct, conduct applies to Stellenbosch University employees and and students and so that wouldn't be able to be applied to someone that falls outside of the university um you know when it comes to the evaluation of a person's behavior if i want to put it into into that category um if you're talking about you know abiding by the general research ethics guidelines or um the rules and, and laws or regulations for research that come from our national government um and then, then it's often just about, uh, you're right, setting up an M MOU or a contract or some kind of understanding between the two parties that there's this set of legislation that applies to any research that's conducted in South Africa. And regardless of who the partners are and whether there's ethics approval from the international partner, um, one still has to go through all of these required processes here in Stellenbosch because that's a that's a South African requirement um, and it holds our research to a, to a high standard. And what we see, uh, what I've seen most commonly, I guess, in sort of competing legislation is in the USA, um, if, they, if you have a large set of data, even human data that has been anonymized, it is not considered human subjects research. And um, so they don't have to, they're not required to put that research through an ethics committee in the United States. But according to our legislation in South Africa, even if you have anonymized a large data set, it's, if it's human data, it's still considered human subjects research, and it still must go through, um, you know, the, the same ethics review and the processes required required here. So those are, the, you know, that's just one example of some of the many differences in legislation and guidelines. Uh, the rule of thumb there is always that we have to we have to go through the South African process. Um, I hope that answers your question, but you're welcome to follow up if I've if I've missed something. Thanks. So I was um, thinking um, specifically in my case was thinking about sort of um, you know we as we um, sort of build our capacity. One of the ways we've done that is to collaborate with people outside the university in co-supervision roles. Mm -hmm. So and and then you know the jurisdiction, the same kind of protocols. I don't know, you know, how does one deal with that? <laughs> yeah, I think the MOU is the best way to go um, right. because then you at least are. Um, creating the opportunity for a discussion and agreement about those things prior to the beginning of the research and everyone's on the same page before you begin. Yeah, okay, thank you. Colleagues, are there more questions from the audience? Um, Nicola, I'm thinking the one, I'm always trying to think of ways that we can um, you know, we, we've been through these investigations and we, we all, we both know at least, <laughs> having been through them, how difficult they can be. And what we want to do more of at the university certainly is to, to prevent mm -hmm. um, cases um, 
occurring and that we want to do more awareness raising. The fact that we have policies, of course, uh, kind of gives one the idea that this is something one can police, but it's actually not um, not really possible to police. It it is um, it is really within each laboratory, within each person's um, mind, is doing the right thing, even if nobody's watching. Um, of course, our ethics processes are, it's, a, it's like a constant peer review. So we, we're immensely grateful for people willing to serve on the ethics committees. And I think, yeah, people also get a lot of, of they learn a lot from serving on those ethics committees as well. I don't know if you, I, I see your, um, there's a, a comment in the in the chat box, which I will read now, but I don't know if you maybe wanted to say something, Nicola, about the ethics committees <laughs> and um, the fact that we, also need people to volunteer their time yeah. to serve on those committees. Yeah, and I think, uh, Tarina, you're raising an incredibly important point because we have, um, as I mentioned, really strong ethics committees um, at the moment and they serve our university really well, but it's a struggle because we could really use more members. So um, in my 10 years at the Faculty of Medicine, um, we recruited a lot of new members, some of them, I'll be honest, hesitantly in the beginning, they really didn't want to join. Um, and I can honestly say that every person who served their term at, on the ethics committee, um, some of them decided to stay because of the learning experience and the enjoyment um, or the sense of reward. Um, and um, those who couldn't stay for whatever reasons um, left with a very different uh, thought of what it meant to serve on an ethics committee. If they were resistant or reticent in the beginning, um, they left with a, a sense of having learnt a lot and a sense of having contributed towards the community. At the moment, um, and uh, this is where what Tarina says um, comes into play, the, the load is heavy on ethics committees. Um, with the inc there's been quite a dramatic increase in research uh, since the beginning of last year with the emergence of COVID. And um, yeah, there, uh, there really is a need for assistance. So if anyone um, is interested, please contact us and we can put you in touch um, with, with the ethics committees uh, to start training and, and getting involved. And I see Laura's comment that it's great fun as well. So, <laughs> fun, but yeah. <laughs> Nicola, um, there was a there's a question from Cedric um, on if you could elaborate on self plagiarism. Yeah. Thanks, Cedric. Um, the self, I, you know, I don't know if I like the wording self plagiarism, but this is the term that has been coined and thrown around um, over the last few years. Um, I think I prefer to call it text recycling. And um, I think there's now this sort of, with this new guideline, a, a growing acknowledgement that, especially in certain fields, um, you know, and we can take an example of the laboratory sciences um, where one uses a particular method and that same method, and you found like a perfect way of describing this method. Um, but every time you publish a, a new article about the method, you've got to find a new way of writing up that method because you don't want to self plagiarize as it's as it's been called. Um, and there's all these um, plagiarism detectors like Turnitin and others that are used by institutions and editors of journals to check that there isn't more of more than a 20 percent similarity between text, uh, you know, in, in other articles. So, you know, there, there, there's been. Um, with this, with the release of these guidelines, the sort of acknowledgement that there are certain circumstances where it's actually ethically appropriate and legally appropriate to recycle one's text. Um, there are cases where you need to do this and there isn't a better or different way to write it. Um, and in those cases, it should be okay to recycle that. Um, you know, the traditional self plagiarism, Cedric, I think that maybe, you know, wanting elaboration of is this the, the idea that someone is publishing um, huge chunks of stuff that they've already published as original information um, in other places without adequately uh, citing it or without 
without there being significant changes um, for it to be recognized as something something new. Cedric, you happy with that reply? Uh, yes, good morning. If you can hear me, I am yes, we can. happy with that reply. Thanks very much, Nicola. Um, I, I think it sort of harks back to the idea that, you know, people should really use citations if they are going to be um, trying to get around this. And it comes down to what you mentioned before that you, you should not cite without adequately referencing the source. Mm. But I would like to put in put in another question as a sort of devil's advocate and, and, and ask you, Nicola, um, how much do you think this publish or perish has contributed to this blossoming of, um, uh, how shall I call it, uh, false journals and false publishing, if I can use the term? Mm -hmm. You know, the incentive to or, or the drive that the incentive gives you or, or puts you under to publish, publish, publish or perish. Mm. To me, it seems that it kind of it's it's angling you down that line of taking the shortest cut. Yeah, and I think you're touching on an important point, Cedric. I mean, regardless of our opinion on it, what the literature, um, what the academic literature is starting to show, um, and there have been a number of studies conducted quite recently, research integrity studies that look at these specific questions. Um, you know, how, what is the effect of these kinds of incentives on human behavior in the research context? Um, it is starting to show evidence of uh, this, this publication climate that we're currently in, definitely pushing pushing the kind of um, questionable research practices that we've been talking about. So, you know, if you're interested in, in reading more about that and the influence the, that the Dutch paper um, and the other systematic review, which I've cited on the slides, are, are definitely worth reading. But, you know, this is where we start to look at empirical evidence and, and what is the empirical evidence telling us about the influence of the current publication climate on the behavior of researchers. Thanks very much, Nicola. Thanks, Nicola. Um, also to remind everybody that on the 18th of August, we will focus very sharply on research publication practices. And this is definitely going to come up um, again as a point of discussion. Um, predatory journals, um, Marie, I saw your comment also that the predatory journals should not be on the DHET accredited list. We hope not, um, but yeah. The, <laughs> It's not always so easy to to um, just identify them immediately. I think there has been a lot of um, cleaning up of those lists, um, but it all takes time, of course. Um, happy to take any more comments or questions um, from the side of the audience. I guess the main um, take home message from today really there would be many but if there's one of the most important ones is that that Nicola in in her position is really there to to advise and to support the research the conduct the responsible conduct of research at Stellenbosch so um, we are here as a division and, and Nicola specifically in her role as well as the ethics people working with the research ethics committees is really part of your team. Uh, we shouldn't be seen as um, just putting hurdles in place for people to jump over, but really to serve as um, part of your team and the support structure that you need to also clear up any uncertainties or answer any questions or provide advice. Um, and that's really an important take home message for me mm. is that we, we are here to support you. Nicola, maybe a last word from your side and if, if anybody else has a question please put up your hand but also take note of our contact details and please contact us afterwards. Nicola? Yeah I mean maybe just to reiterate what you're saying we we are a support office and we're here to support and we have many very wonderful fruitful conversations with researchers who engage with us ahead of starting a research project or while they're in the middle of something and they, they come across something that's challenging for them or a little confusing. Um, so, so please, uh, we, we're here to help. Um, it's, a, it's an honest and sincere offer. Um, and 
it's fun for us actually to think through some of these these ethical challenges and to to assist where we can.